Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, there's no other place we would be going today on this Pentecost Sunday. Today marks Pentecost, the day when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. And certainly this is God's plan for each of our lives. God wants to sanctify, to completely fill the Christian with his Holy Spirit. And the morning, this morning's message has three parts. What Pentecost means to the individual, what it means to us as, as individual people, what it means to the church as a corporate body, and what it means to the world. And we're going to look at this from Acts chapter 2. I'd invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read down through verse 21 of Acts chapter 2. If you found it, would you say Amen. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying, One to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and of Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others, mocking, said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing that it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it came to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be darkened. Turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, today, as we preach from this sacred passage, as we think about this sacred event, help us to then move from looking back on that which is in the past to our own hearts and lives and the present. We pray now that you would have your will and way in this time of the service. It's in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today, first of all, we begin with what Pentecost means to the individual. The first thing we notice is that it means a second change. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. This was new. This was something that had not been done. This was a crisis event in the disciples' lives. After Pentecost, if you look at their stories, they were dramatically different people than they were prior to Pentecost. Yes, we believe they were right with God. We would call them Christians, but after Pentecost, they were markedly different. We can see this from the gospel records. Before Pentecost, they were faltering, wavering. I guess you could even say weak-minded at times. They wanted to stand with Christ, for example, yet they all fled from him. Peter said that he would certainly stand by the Lord, but when pressured by strangers around the fire, Peter vehemently denied the Lord. Prior to Pentecost, they, they had some squibbles and squabbles about who was going to be the greatest. Thomas doubted. They meant well before Pentecost, but the picture of who they were after Pentecost was absolutely dramatically different. They experienced a second change in their lives. Now, some would say that this was a moment of salvation. 
I have to scratch my head at that a little bit because uh, they had been made right with God at an earlier time. Jesus says this directly in John chapter 17. You can look there if you would like this morning. We're reading in verse 12 where he says this. While I was with them, and he's referring to this, this group, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, I, want to, I would just want to emphasize that today because uh, I've heard you know, some things and people say that, oh, well, this was their moment of salvation. Well, Jesus is praying to his father and he's talking about them and he's saying, I have kept them in thy name. If Jesus Christ can testify to God the Father that he has kept me, I think that I am in good standing with God. If Jesus Christ can look at the Father and say, none of them is lost. None of them is lost except for Judas. And we know that Judas was allowed into this group even with his evil intentions because the scriptures had to be fulfilled. The prophecy had to be, had to be uh, carried out and Jesus was going to die. And Judas was the mechanism by which that would happen. But accepting him, Jesus says, none of them is lost. I hope that about each of our lives, Jesus can look at the Father and say, none of them are lost. We are right with God. But in just a few verses, he prays, continues to pray to his Father. And he says in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. That they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither, I, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. You see, it is the prayer of Jesus to the Father that his disciples, who he has kept, they are not lost, that they are sanctified. Adam Clark says this about this word as expressed in verse 17. It signifies consecration, to separate from earth and common use, to devote or dedicate to God in his service, to set aside for a purpose. So you've done this in your house, you've not sanctified an item, but you have dedicated an item for a specific use. He said, that is a coffee mug, that's all that is for. This is for this, this is for that. You have set it apart. And, and, and there's a sense, that's what the word sanctify means, to set apart for an intended use. But it also signifies the meaning of making holy. Or making pure. And I believe the prayer of Christ in John chapter 17 is understood in both of these senses. That he was wanting to set them apart, to sanctify them, but he was also wanting to purify them and make them holy. That they would be fully consecrated to the work of the ministry, separated from all worldly concerns, and that they might be holy and, and be a pattern of holiness to all of those whom they announce the salvation of God. He was praying for for this. Jesus also takes it even further. He says, for their sakes, verse 19, I sanctify myself. Now, Jesus, we know, was the sinless son of God. He had no need of a purifying work. But here he testifies to being set apart. Remember, there's two expressions of this, of being set apart for an intended purpose. And we know what that intended purpose was and is to secure full and free salvation for all of humanity. He was being set apart, dedicated for this holy task. To the individual, Pentecost is a second change. Secondly, Pentecost to the individual was a purifying work. Peter did not say they received pardon. He says they were purified. There's a lot of people who want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but they do not want to allow the Holy Spirit to have his cleansing work in their heart. 
They want to be filled with the fullness of God. They want the power of God, and yet they are not willing to allow the Spirit to have his cleansing work. When uh, they visit Cornelius in Acts chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, and God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them. Listen to this. Purifying their hearts by faith. Sometimes the purifying process can be a painful process. As God begins to, as some of the old songs and, and um, different preachers have preached about the dross that's on the inside and the refiner's fire that must burn in our hearts and purge out all that is unnecessary. It is a purifying experience. Thirdly, to the individual, it's not only a second change, a purifying work, but it also is the giving of personal power. The instruction and promise of Christ was this. Tarry ye until you be what? Endued with power from on high. Ye shall receive of the Holy Ghost coming, and you will then be witnesses. You have to notice that this was a special power. If you look back, you know that God has already given them power to do some things. They, in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, for example, they've been given power over the enemy, serpents, and scorpions. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, they're given power to live as Christians, to be the sons of God. But this power at Pentecost was a new power. It was a power uh, specifically to be witnesses. Now, we often think witnessing has to do with telling people about Christ. And I, I, it does. But that's also called evangelism. When we witness to someone, we tell them what God has done for us. We tell them a personal experience that God has worked, a work that God has done in our life. When we witness to them, we say, God has saved me from my sin. What is a witness? It is somebody who was there. You go to a courtroom, what is a witness? It is someone who was there, who saw it or heard it, and then they tell about it. And this is the power, among others, that God wants to give to his people whom he infills. He wants us to begin to speak about what God has done in our life. What happened to them? They instantly spilled out onto the street, so to speak, and they began to witness. They began to tell what had happened. Fifthly, for the individual... Pentecost means a fullness of blessing. They were all filled. Sanctification has been called the uncontainable blessing. The person who is saved uh, may have a tendency after a time to sit quiet in a worship service, go for weeks without witnessing, and could be a pew person. But when they are sanctified, they become a vessel that cannot fully contain the glory of God, and it spills over to those around them. They are full and overflowing. I remember the day God sanctified me. I was in college, and I wanted to be a preacher who was quiet, dignified, and stayed behind the pulpit. See how that worked out. And I remember God sanctified me in a church foyer. I can't explain all of that. I don't have time to tell you the story, but I just know that the witness of the Spirit came, that all was done. And when I walked through the doors and we marched up the aisle to sing, God's blessing just fell on me. And I shouted and I exhorted and I praised God. And I did the stuff that I said I never wanted to do. I didn't want to be that guy. But it wasn't me. God came and he filled me and I couldn't help but tell about what God had done in my life. There is a fullness. And if you are empty this morning, God can fill you. If you are an empty vessel, God can fill you to overflowing. If the cup has run empty, it is not God's fault. It is your fault. You have gotten away from the source and you need to get back to the source so that God can fill you once again. Pentecost to the person means a second definite change. It means purification. It means power. It means freedom from fear. It means the fullness of blessing. This is what God wants to do in your life. Now, when something happens to a bunch of individuals and they're all together, there is a corporate change. So we move from looking at the individuals and what God did for them to what God did for the church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, we find that there was a numerical increase. And the Lord added. I like when, when God does math. And the Lord added to the church 
daily such as should be saved. In this church, there was no need for an elaborate uh, entertainment and athletic program. They didn't need uh, uh, any kind of gimmick. They were simply baptized by the Spirit, and the Lord added. John Wesley wrote in his journal in October of 1756, he says, I examined the Society of Bristol and was surprised to find 50 members fewer than I left in last October. And and one reason is Christian perfection has been little insisted on, and wherever this is not done, be the preacher ever so eloquent, there is little increase, either in the number or the grace of the hearers. I want to remind you as a corporate body now, that if our church is going to grow and be what God wants us to be, we are going to have to be wholly sanctified and set apart for his use. We are going to have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, or we will die. There is no future at the corner of Covered Bridge and Creek Roads if we do not have God on this place. And the only way to really get God on this scene is to have God in our hearts, to go to the upper room. You see, there was a small amount that were affected, but it spilled out and it affected the church at large. It meant that God added to the church daily. Secondly, it meant fellowship. It's easier to fellowship with sanctified individuals, people who are full of the Spirit. Uh, It's just much easier. There's a heart void of envy and pride and jealousy or any other of the negative qualities of the natural carnal nature. A heart purified by faith is pleasant company to keep. Now, if you read down through this passage, some would say this was an endorsement of socialism because they sold what they had and, and did all of this. No, not on your life. What it was, was they were so moved by what God had done. There was so little of themselves. They just let go of all that was earthly. They just simply let it go. And this is an, this is an important part. One of the things that worried us through COVID, and as we were in the parking lot, as we were, and a lot of churches have been online, is this lack of fellowship. We need to connect one another. This is one of the results of a spirit-filled church, is we will begin to interact with one another. We will begin to build each other up. We will begin to edify the body of believers. And that needs to happen more, not less. But it is key. The Spirit of God must do this. The third thing that happened in the church was there was an increased teaching ministry. I don't know if they opened two Sunday schools or not, but in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What's doctrine? It's teaching and fellowship. And in breaking of bread, they did eat together. And in prayers. If God is on the scene, we are going to begin to teach and to learn. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is a love for learning. Oh, maybe not book knowledge. You know, God does math. I just mentioned that. But maybe it's not uh, uh, the higher sciences or advanced math courses. But there should be in the heart, even if your mind is weak, even if your IQ is very low, there should be in your heart, in the core of who you are, the desire to know more and more and more of God. And when you have that desire, you begin to devour the teachings of God's word. You approach the word, not looking for loopholes, but looking for guidance. Lord, show me what I should do. Show me where I should go. Apply this to my life. Too many people crack open the Bible and they're looking for loopholes. They're looking for workarounds. They're looking for things that they can get away from. That is not the case with the person indwelt by the spirit of God. They are looking for things that they can apply to their life and apply to their heart this is what Pentecost means. There will be an increased teaching and learning in the church. It will also be a giving church. All necessary finances were provided. We mentioned that. They sold what they had and they gave. We don't have to worry about money in the church when God's on the scene. When God's blessing and helping, we don't worry about it. We're careful. We had budget meetings this week. I know we're careful. But that's not really what it's about. It's about God blessing because God knows our needs even when we do not. And God knows how to direct people to give. And if you feel on your heart, I'm not just talking about the church offering, but if God impresses someone in the congregation 
or your neighbor or somebody that God lays on your heart and says, hey, give them a little something or take them a meal or help them out. You respond to the spirit of God. God's trying to work in your life. This is part of being led by the spirit. He's going to supply the need. How many times does a missionary come and stand behind this pulpit and talk about how they had a need and they prayed and out of the blue... God shipped them something in a box. You've heard the story about the glasses that were shipped accidentally. That's the spirit of God. But on the other end of that is a spirit-filled believer who's responding to the prompts of the spirit, maybe before that prayer is even prayed. Everything was provided for. Fifthly, to the church, it meant conquest. The church without the Pentecostal experience ceases, or, or the church, rather, with the Pentecostal experience Ceases to be a hospital where two-thirds of the membership is on the sick list and the remaining third are all engaged as nurses. When Pentecost comes to the church, we are ready for battle. We are ready to do great things for God. As the individual members, so goes the church. And there comes a swing of victory. And there will be gladness in much praising God and taking of the spoils. This is the kind of thing that happened back in 1932 and back in 1934. And we could point to times over and over and again in our lives when God moved. When God's people get filled with the Spirit, they do something for God. Amen. So tonight, or this... I've said tonight, I said good evening to almost every person that came through the door. I apologize. So today, it's about ready to be tonight if I keep preaching. So today, to the individual, we studied what it means. Now we've talked about what it means to the church. But now for just a moment, I want to talk about what Pentecost meant to the world. Number one, we find this. It arrested attention. You see, people run to a fire. When a church spiritually catches on fire, people will run to see it burn. And one of the major reasons people never darken church doors is, or return for a second visit, they don't expect anything to happen. Why would I go sit there and do that when I could sit at home? But when God does something, people will come, even if it's just out of curiosity. Many a sinner has sat on the back row of a church on a Sunday night, coming out of curiosity, coming because a family member came, but God arrested their attention. And that's what happened to this world. Secondly, it meant conviction. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked. In their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? But is there any question or any surprise at that? Jesus had promised in John chapter 16, verses 7 through 8, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if he depart, I will send him unto you, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The musicians are coming to the instruments at this time. A spirit-filled individual will convict more people of sin than the greatest preacher to ever stand behind this pulpit, the best music to ever uh, be sung from this platform or any other. Or the most finely planned service or event that a church can offer. The spirit-filled individual will bring conviction in the lives of people around them. The third thing it meant to the world was salvation. The Lord added to the church daily. The multitudes came together. They were amazed and marveled. They were pricked in their hearts and feared God. 3,000 people were saved. 120 people in the upper room. 3,000 people. That's 25 new converts for every spirit-filled believer. Think about what God can do. But this morning, I want to take us from just looking back at this as an historical fact. We look back and we see what God did to the world through this incredible day. We say, that's great, that's neat to read about, like a battle that was victorious for the American side, or that's neat. But it's not just neat. It's not just back there. It's present. God wants to do something in our world, but he's going to use the church to do it. 
He's going to use not just any church. He's going to use the church that has the fire and the glory who has had Pentecost. But the church will not have Pentecost. So this building can't have Pentecost. This is not an ark. This is not some, it is a sacred object in a sense, but it's not like God just dwells here by default. No, there's many times I come through the door and sense God's presence even when the building's empty. But this building is steel. It is carpet and drywall. And in the grand scheme of things, when the earth is consumed, it will be consumed with it. But what makes the difference is when the people in the church individually surrender to God and they go to the upper room and they ask God to purify their hearts by faith and indwell them and fill them with the Spirit, then God can move. And as God moves on this one and this one and this one and this one, all of a sudden that church catches fire and that church goes out into the world and great things happen for God. We're standing together. The altar is open this morning on this Pentecost Sunday. If you need to pray, if you need to be filled with the fullness of God, if you need to have the dross burned out in your heart, if there's something, and really when we open the altar and it's sort of specific like this, I want to remind you that if you have any need, if you need to be saved this morning, this altar's open. If you have a burden on your heart, this altar's open. God wants to work. The same God who caused the people to spill out onto the streets is the same God who wants to work in your heart and in your life today. We're singing, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. And if you would like to pray today, or if you need to pray today, the altar is open. Spirit of the living God, fall. Pastor, I don't know what to think about all this. Well, here's what I want you to know, is that if God is speaking to your heart, you need to come. If God is drawing you to himself, then you need to come. You'll never regret responding to the Spirit of God. You'll never regret resisting the, the self-life and saying, rejecting it. It says, no, what will people think? No, what will, you know, all these questions. You know, that's a combination of Satan speaking and carnality and whatever. But that's what we're trying to put to death. That's what we're trying to, to get rid of. And we come to the upper room. We come not caring what the crowd on the street thinks. We don't care what anyone else thinks. We just want all of God. We want the Spirit of God to fall fresh on us. We're singing this one more time. And then we're going to gather in for prayer. Spirit of the living God. folks come to the altar to pray. If you must leave, uh, do so quietly and uh, we thank you so much for coming today. But let's close this service with a time of prayer around the altar. As many as would come, if you need to go home, you may. If you'd like to be seated, that's fine as well.